I knew much of the great Ostanako, the warrior and orator of the Cherokee. He was always the guest of my father on his journeys to and from Williamsburg. I was in his camp when he made his great farewell oration to his people the evening before he departed for England. The moon was in full splendor, and to her he seemed to address himself in his prayers for his own safety on the voyage and that of his people during his absence. His sounding voice, distinct articulation, animated action, and the solemn silence of his people at their several fires filled me with awe and veneration, although I did not understand a single word he uttered. A few days before they were to depart for their own country, Mr. Horrocks invited Ostanaku and myself to sup with him at the college, where, amongst other curiosities, he showed him the picture of his present majesty. The chief viewed it a long time with particular attention. When turning to me, Long, he said, I have wished to see the king, my father. This is his resemblance, but I am determined to see him myself. I am now near the sea, and never will depart from it, till I have obtained my desires. He asked the governor the next day who, though he at first refused, on Ostanako's insisting so strongly upon it, gave his consent. He then desired, as I had been with him so long, that I might accompany him to England. This I was to do at my own expense, but the governor told me he would recommend me to the Minister of State, which he did in as strong terms as I could desire. I was then upon the point of entering into a very advantageous commerce, which I quit to please the Indians. I prepared everything necessary for my voyage, but this was not my only expense. The Indians, having no money, expect the person who travels with them to treat them with whatever they take a fancy to. So we set out for Hampton about the beginning of May, where we were to embark, but contrary winds and other delays retarded us till the 15th, during which time it generally cost me between 15 and 20 shillings per day. We had very fine weather during the whole voyage, Yet both the Indians and myself were seasick all the way. We had the misfortune here to lose the interpreter Shuri, which was much regretted by us all, but especially by the Indians, as he was a thorough master of their language. He had lingered some time in a consumption caught in a small river, for being drunk, his Indian spouse plunged him in to sober him, but was unable to draw him out. On the 16th of June, we arrived at Plymouth, while in the boat that took us to shore, Ostanako, painted in a very frightful manner, sung a solemn dirge with a very loud voice to return God thanks for his safe arrival. The loudness and uncouthness of his singing and the oddity of his person drew a vast crowd of boats filled with spectators from all the ships in the harbour, and the landing place was so thronged that it was almost impossible to get to the inn, where we took post for London. This video is sponsored by Magellan TV. Question, what is the oldest city in the United States? Is it A, St. Augustine, Florida? B, Plymouth, Massachusetts? Or C, Old San Juan, Puerto Rico? Yes, of course the answer is none of them, as Native American cities were there long before. And so, take a dive into early American history with my recommendation on Magellan this week. Witch Hunt in Salem. It's a great docudrama that really puts you into the shoes of early settlers and the paranoia and fear that grew amongst them. I'm hoping to do a video on Salem soon, and this was a great primer. And of course, Magellan has more than 3,000 other documentaries to check out too. And this Christmas, Voices of the Past viewers can take advantage of a special holiday offer. Buy one, get one free gift cards for an annual membership by clicking on the link in the description. Thanks. We stopped at Exeter, where the Indians were shown the cathedral, but, contrary to my expectations, were as little struck as if they had been natives of the place. They were much better pleased the next day with Lord Pembroke's seat at Wilton, till they saw the statue of Hercules with his club uplifted, which they thought so dreadful that they begged immediately to be gone. We arrived the next day in London. 
Captain Blake waited on Lord Egremont to acquaint him with our arrival. We were immediately sent for, and after some few questions, dismissed. I, however, took this opportunity of flipping my letter of recommendation into his lordship's hands, which he read and assured me he would show it to the king that day, telling me to let the Indians or myself want for nothing. My first care was to equip the Indians, so I asked Mr. Cacanthropus to order all after the mode of their own country. The Cherokees are of a middle stature, of an olive colour, though generally painted, and their skin stained with gunpowder, pricked into it in very pretty figures. The hair of their head is shaved, except a patch on the hinder part of the head, about twice the bigness of a crown piece, which is ornamented with beads, feathers, wampum, stained deer's hair, and such like baubles. The ears are slit and stretched to an enormous size, putting the person who undergoes the operation in incredible pain. The uncommon appearance of the Cherokees began to draw after them great crowds of people of all ranks, at which they were so much displeased that home became irksome to them, and they were forever telling me to take them to some public diversion. Their favourite was Sadler's Wells, the activity of the performers and the machinery of the pantomime agreeing best with their notions of diversions. But they were better pleased with Vauxhall, and though it was always against my inclination, I accompanied them there on account of the ungovernable curiosity of the people, who often intruded on them and induced them to drink more than sufficient. Once, in particular, one of the young Indians got extremely intoxicated and committed several irregularities that ought rather to be attributed to those that enticed them than to the simple Indians who drank only to please them. Though they are very hardy, bearing heat, cold, hunger and thirst in a surprising manner, no people are given to more excess in eating and drinking when it is conveniently in their power. The follies, nay, mischief they commit when inebriated are entirely laid to the liquor, and no one will revenge any injury, murder excepted, received from one who is no more himself. They are not less addicted to gaming than drinking, and will even lose the shirt off their back rather than give over play when luck runs against them. I cannot indeed cite sobriety as their characteristic, but this I can say. These excesses never happened in the house we stayed. A bottle of wine, a bowl of punch and a little cider being the ordinary consumption of the three Indians, Sumter and myself. And as we were seldom at home, it could not put the nation to a great expense. So, if the bills given in for these articles were to the greatest degree excessive, let them that charge them answer who consumed them. I only know that no more was ever drank by us. Unfortunately, this was not the only thing laid to my charge. I was accused of receiving money for admission to see the Indians. It was a long time before I knew anything of these money-taking schemes. The following accident was what brought it to light. Our man Sumter, who had contracted some genteel acquaintance, some of whom he was bringing to see the Indians, was stopped by the servant, who refused to admit them without money. Sumter received that affront from an insolent servant, but, not being able to bear the insult, he took a warrior's satisfaction and knocked him down. A blunt Virginian soldier cannot know the laws of England, as little can he bear an insult from so mean a quarter. Soon after these disturbances, orders were given by Lord Egremont that no person whatever should be admitted without an order from himself or Mr. Wood, Under Secretary of State. But instead of the throngs decreasing by this order, they rather increased, and I really believe few persons have more friends than Mr. Wood. They even pressed into the Indians' dressing room, which gave them the highest disgust, these people having a particular aversion to being stared at while dressing or eating. They were so disgusted that they grew extremely shy of being seen, so that I had the greatest difficulty in procuring people a sight of them. As several days passed before I had any further orders, the Indians became extremely anxious to see the king. What is the reason, said they, that we are not admitted to see the great king, our father, after coming so far for the purpose? I was obliged to reply that his majesty was indisposed and could not be waited on till perfectly recovered, which in some measure pacified them. 
They are extremely proud, despising the lower class of Europeans. And in some athletic diversions I once was present at, they refuse to match or hold conference with any but officers. They seldom turn their eyes on the person they speak of or address themselves to, and are always suspicious when people's eyes are fixed upon them. They speak so low, except in council, that they are often obliged to repeat what they were saying. Yet should a person talk to any of them above their common pitch, they would immediately ask him if he thought they were deaf. Some time before they left England, they were admitted, finally, to a conference with His Majesty at St. James's. Ostanako's speech on that occasion contained nothing more than protestations of friendship and faithful alliance, to which an answer was afterwards given in writing, to be interpreted in their own country, as I was not conversant enough in their language to translate it, though I understood whatever they said, especially the speech which I gave word for word to His Majesty as Shuri had likewise explained it before his death, except the last part, which indeed was so much in my favour that I was obliged to suppress it. They were struck with the youth, person and grandeur of his majesty, and conceived as great an opinion of his affability as of his power. Finding Ostanako preparing his pipe to smoke with his majesty, according to the Indian custom of declaring friendship, I told him he must neither offer to shake hands or smoke with the king, as it was an honour for the greatest of our nation to just kiss his hand. You are in the right, he told me, for he commands over all next to the man above, and nobody is his equal. Their ideas were likewise greatly increased by the number of ships in the river and the warren at Woolwich, which I did not fail to set out to the greatest advantage intimating that our sovereign had many such ports and arsenals around the kingdom. Some days before the Indians set out on their return to their own country, Lord Egremont sent for me and informed me that the Indians were to be landed at Charlestown. But this was so contrary to their inclination that Ostanako positively declared that, unless he was to land in Virginia, he would not stir a step from London. I informed his lordship that it was entirely out of my power to accompany them there, having scarce five shillings remaining out of the 130 pounds I had received, the best part of which I laid out for the Indian's use, that I was ready to obey his lordship if he would please order me wherewith to defray my expenses. My lord replied that no more could be advanced, that if I refused to accompany them, others must be found that would. Had I really had the money, I should not have troubled the government or deserted the Indians, but to be landed in a strange country, without money, and far from my friends, did not seem very eligible. So the Indians soon re-embarked in the same vessel that brought them, and left England about the 25th of August, so that I was now entirely at my own expense, without money or friends.